Okay. Cześć wszystkim, witamy na 138 spotkaniu grupy .NET w wersji online. Nazywam się Konrad i jest ze mną Sebastian. Cześć. Also, uh, would like to say welcome to everyone. I know that there are some uh, people watching us from abroad, or maybe they will be watching to, uh, later on YouTube. So one 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 more time, welcome everybody. And yeah, and let me go to the next slide. Mm, I will say in English. Uh, uh, there was a plan to have two presentation today. Uh, first one uh, mm, will be. Uh, <laughs> there was a plan that will be Martin uh, lead, uh, led us, uh, lead this, uh, but unfortunately he sent us SMS like one hour ago he, that he's sick. So we'll start uh, immediately from the second presentation, which is led by Matthias, and I'm adding to the stream. Hello, are you with us? Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, of course, the English will be in English, and uh, there is one rule that we would like to ask you: write your question to Matthias on chat, and after his presentation, we will uh, show it on on stream, and he will happy to answer to everything that you will ask us. Uh, we'll back to Polish right now, just for two slides. Sorry. <laughs> Okej, okay, so, więc jak zwykle naszym sponsorem jest 7N. Siódemki pomagają, pomagają no zazwyczaj w logistycznych kwestiach wprowadzać nam wykładowców naszych, kiedy mamy offline'owe spotkania. Na razie tego nie ma, prowadzimy online. Niemniej cały czas siódemki są, są z nami jako jedyny, jako jedyny sponsor. Sebastian? Uh, uh, yeah, from your school. <laughs> so as usual, <laughs> uh, we invite invite you to uh, uh, present on our group. As there are, currently our meetings are online, so there is no problem if someone from abroad would like to join. <laughs> and uh, like Matthias, show us something great about .NET uh, or .NET tooling. Uh, so uh, contact us either via uh, Meetup or. Uh, using uh, Twitter and uh, we'll find a slot for your presentation. So please come. <laughs> yep, I think that's it. And let me share uh, Matthias' screen. Okay, okay, so uh, have a good session. I will, I will remove myself and Sebastian and go ahead. Okay, cool. So hello everyone. Uh, nice to have you on the talk, at least, unfortunately, <laughs> without seeing. Um, but uh, I hope you're all well. And I will talk today a little bit about one of my projects, <laughs> my single project that I maintain, and it's like a pet project. Um, it's called Nuke, and it, it is uh, similar to um, other tools, like if you heard about uh, Fake or Cake, for instance, um, or MS Build. If you if you do your build automation in MS Build, then I'm sure this will um, this will be interesting for you. So the talk's titled uh, "Modern Build Automation for C# -Sharp and .NET," and let's dive in. Actually, I, I was <laughs> um, you you heard that already. I, uh, that was a bit of a quick call. Uh, I would like to. Uh, have more time to add some slides to make a little more introduction but i will just do this ad hoc now so uh, ju just to make a quick definition of what build automation actually is so um for those of you who've never touched it in any way uh, the term build automation usually means that uh, for our d uh, for our software life cycle um, we have several build steps that we usually perform that could include something like compiling a solution, um, packaging that into NuGet packages or, or installer files, um, deploying that to certain endpoints where people can, can download that, um, and many, many more. So um, usually, I mean, that's at least for, from my experience um, a couple of years ago, um, usually in teams, you always had that one person um, that knows how the build works, and and for instance on Team City or or Azure Pipelines 
or Azure pipelines at that time. It was called VSTS, I think, still. Um, but yeah, and usually you only have one person. And if that person is absent, then you go crazy when something doesn't work. So Nuke is a, is a way or was intended to solve that issue. And um, also a little bit more about the background. I started at my previous company um, maintaining and 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 yeah maintaining the build scripts. At that time, we were still using MS Build. Um, sometime later, we were switching to PowerShell, uh, which we also used for deployments very heavily. And I skipped Fake. Um, I, I was always curious and and wanted to dive further in, into into Fake, but Fake uses F Sharp as a as a um, as a host language. And after a while, and every, every time I looked at it, I, I felt rather uncomfortable because I didn't know F sharp. And I think in 2017, I stumbled across Cake again. Actually, it was the second time. And I used it to a certain degree, but found some issues pretty quickly. And uh, not even that, I mean, the, those were mostly issues from my perspective at least that aren't uh, so easy to solve because it's much about the foundation how the whole project is set up and nuke was supposed to be something different something that uses modern techniques uh, modern um, concepts in in .NET and c sharp and that's what we will look at and the subtitle for that is uh, is 10 ingredients for an aless uh, build system so uh, that that is a pun I, I shamelessly copied from, from Nikolai Andersen, um, who gave a presentation, I think, about fake some, some years ago at the NSC. And yeah, Nuke basically is also a build system. You would, it should follow the same uh, naming pattern, but there is already cake. So I thought new make uh, makes Nuke. <laughs> okay, and we start with the first ingredient, and that is console application. So the idea behind that is uh, much of the other tools use some, uh, they use some scripting approach. Um, so you don't have any, you don't have, or at least very little tooling uh, that helps you to write those, those uh, build scripts. And with Nuke, it's different because it is really just a simple console application. Um, so here in, uh, in this case, this is writer, very, in a very reduced version, so just to make it fit on the screen. Um, and we see here on the left, this is my uh, this is my solution. And there's one project which is called uh, underscore build. And it's uh, it contains one single file, which we can see here, it's the build.cs file. And here we just have one class that inherits from, from a base class and defines a, um, a console and entry point. I mean, everyone has seen that. It's, this is just public static in main. It returns an integer, integer. And the the interesting thing here is that it only delegates to Nuke as a framework. So after that execute method, Nuke will take over and uh, do all the things. A second thing that we do here. Well, first we pass a reference to to our type, to our enclosing type, because we are static, so we we kind of have to do that. And in this uh, lambda right here, we also pass the default target, which should be invoked. So uh, if I call this build and I don't pass a target, for instance, then it should uh, then it should execute world. If I pass hello, for instance. Then it should just execute hello. And now the interesting thing here, and that, that is a common technique in, in build automation, um, for those two targets, hello and world, well, you could also call them build steps, but I have stick with the naming target. Target is also used in MS build, so I, I thought that would be a better idea. And a common technique here is that targets can depend on each other. So world, for instance, depends on hello. And if we execute world, then what happens is that hello gets executed first and world afterwards. And we kind of, in some sense, have, have our hello world example. I won't execute that right here because it's an image. 
uh, no, but uh, we will we will look into into that a little bit later again. One thing that's quite interesting and that is very different to all the other build systems out there, at least to my knowledge. Um, most of them use target names that are strings. So MS Build definitely MS Build uses XML, but also Cake and and uh, Fake. Um, they use strings to define the targets. And the issue now here, uh, I mean, in Nuke, we won't have it, but the issue would be that if we rename one of them, we need to be very careful to also rename all the other instances of that string. There's a, there's a simple workaround. We could just define a global uh, field or something and use that uh, in, in every place where the string is expected. Um, but it, it's not forced upon you. With Nuke, it's different because here we can see hello and world. They are actual um, C-sharp uh, symbols. And usually if I would be in person in front of you, which was actually the plan uh, in, the, in the beginning of the year, but then things happen. Um, but those two, uh, those two are actually properties um, which are expression-based. So the first arrow here, and this is just a ligature uh, from my font, but this is just a, an equals and a greater as sign. And the first part is an expression bodied uh, arrow, let's say, for, for the property. And the thing afterwards, so including the underscore, et cetera, until here is a delegate. And that is, I admit, this is not really it's not exactly beautiful, but I can assure you after some time, you barely notice that uh, in anymore. So, and, and the benefit now is if we rename hello uh, with our uh, favorite uh, refactoring tools, may it be Rider or Visual Studio, um, then it would also update right here and we don't need to worry about that. We even have complete com completion, at least inside Rider and Reshaper here in depends on because it expects a target and we don't we don't need to bother with anything else um the next thing for nuke as an ingredient is the global tool and the global tool uh, some of you probably uh, know about global tools in the dotnet core sdk um, they are like, let's go back for a moment, um, they are like NPM global tools. I think NPM, NPM has something uh, very similar where you can install a tool which is available in any any place you like to call it. So it's available like Echo, for instance. It becomes a proper command line uh, command that you, that you can use. And to install that global tool, this is what you have to execute. Uh, .NET tool install nuke.global tool and then dash dash global. Um, it doesn't really make sense to have that as a, as a repository tool um, or, or a local tool. Um, I usually advise against that, although you could do it, but it makes no sense from my point of view. Now, uh, something very interesting that the global tool also gives us, and, and let's focus on the first part here. Uh, this is the output from nuke dash dash help. So first we get all the targets listed with their direct dependencies. And for instance, we see compile would uh, depend on restore. And we also see the um, parameters, the default parameters, which are defined. Those are also extensible. Um, which we will see in a second. But the great benefit of the global tool uh, that we can see here, and that is uh, shell completion. So we type just dash dash s and then tap, and we complete to skip for restore. And we can also complete verbosity. And it al also knows that verbose is, is, a, is a value for verbosity. And this is really great. Um, it works. The, the .NET CLI actually also has, a, has this approach. Um, you, need to, you need to tweak your bash or, or fish or PowerShell settings a little. Um, but we also provide uh, snippets for that to just get going with that. And this is a very interesting and very neat way of calling your, your build. And the second uh, thing 
we can do with the global tool is set, setting our build up in a solution. So in this case, for that image, actually, I should have removed the build folder and the PowerShell and sh shell script. So just imagine only the first two items are here. And what we do is to call a new um, colon setup. Afterwards, we start with a, with something yeah, like a setup wizard. And the first question is, uh, how should the build project be named? It's just a console application, so you can choose. The default is underscore build. Then where should, should it be located? Um, for me, my pre preference is um, in the build subdirectory. We can choose from a couple of versions that are available. So also um, pre-release, for instance, if you like, if it's available. And we can choose to already add it to default solution. So if you don't like putting your uh, build project into the usual solution which uh, with which you're working, um, then you can also choose none and it won't be added. But I really like, and that's the that's the great benefit of Nuke, that you can have it side by side um, with your solution. It becomes code as, as anything else. And and it's quite accessible to people, and you don't forget to update it if your if your um, repository structure changes. It's more pro way more prominent in your workflow. There's also a more extensive wizard, um, which is a bit outdated. But here, <laughs> for the showcase, I I have chosen uh, to just finish the setup, and the effect of that setup, just to have kind of a conclusion here, is. Um, we add this build uh, C Sharp project. We have a default build implementation. We have two scripts uh, which help with the, uh, with the bootstrapping on Windows and Unix systems. And the interesting part here is that, that those files, um, there are two versions of them. There's the version to bootstrap with, um, with the .NET framework which uses either .NET Framework or Mono um, on Unix systems, or there's the way to use the .NET SDK. And I, e even if you compile .NET Frameworks, you can use the uh, build bootstrap with the .NET SDK. And I recommend to that because it's much easier. It's, it's much more resilient. Um, but those scripts will also make sure that the proper SDK is installed. Um, the the one defined uh, in global.json, for instance. If nothing is, is defined, then it will just use the latest one. Um, we also have two files which help you with the um, with some pre-definitions for formatting. And like I said, if we've chosen to, um, to add it to the solution, then the solution file will also be changed. Now, one thing that I skipped is the .nuke file, and that will change in the in the near future um, usually the dot nuke file um, marks the root directory of our of our repository and usually this is uh, the same place where the dot git uh, folder is located why dot nuke if we have dot git well some people still use uh, subversion so uh, this is to um, to mark the the root directory the next thing is target model, and we already um, we already touched that for a moment when I talked about this depends on uh, thing between targets and dependencies between targets. I mean, like that, like world depends on on, on hello is not the only way you want to express their um, their way more. Um, MS Build, for instance, also defines the ways of um, defining before targets and after targets, for instance. And this is the very same, although I have a couple more uh, things you can do. Um, to explain that as a whole, I want to look with you as an, uh, at an dependency graph uh, in a, yeah, for a pipeline that uh, is, can be considered a general pipeline something that everyone can can get familiar with and let's start with compile so the first thing if you want to build is compile and then unit tests and integration tests they both depend on 
they both depend on compile and i know usually the arrow uh, the arrows should uh, point in the different direction but this is based on the tool that i used to create those so sorry for that just suppose the arrows are uh, are showing in the different direction so unit tests and integration tests both depend on compile if we want to execute tests then this depends on unit test and integration test and yeah we have this it would be the whole which would be executed and now something interesting is there <clears throat> because for instance this clean target this clean target has all, uh, also has an edge <clears throat> sorry also has an edge to the compile target but it's dashed and dashed here represents that this is not a, um, a hard dependency but it's rather than if those targets if those two targets are com uh, executed um, in combination <clears throat> then clean should be um, executed before compile okay so otherwise if I execute compile then clean won't be executed but interestingly publish has a hard dependency on clean. And now if I execute publish, then in some way compile will be executed, but also we make sure that clean is, is, uh, is executed before compile. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a bad throw today. Okay, the same with inspect, uh, just a little bit differently. And now a second thing which is quite interesting is this announce target. Just suppose you have a, a build pipeline and at the very end you want to announce that you deployed a new version. Now it would be it would be really mm, weird, at least for me, to say uh, we have a normal dependency here and then we invoke the announce target because this is not really what you do. What you want to do is to publish and announce is more like a thing that comes afterwards, right? So. This yellow line, I hope you can see it, but this, this line is completely yellow, um, indicates triggers, which means after publish has finished, announce will be executed. And now based on this uh, dependency graph, I want to show you uh, in which way you can define those dependencies. And we've already seen the, the one way, let's go back for a moment, uh, where we have depends on and this is the place, I'm, I mean, I won't show it with uh, pure code, but this is the place wh uh, what we are talking about now. So let's go back. Um, the first is compile depends on restore. So then we can say it depends on restore or that that would be on the compile uh, target or on the restore target, we could say dependent for compile. Um, for those um, ordering dependencies or soft dependencies, if you want to call them like that, uh, restore must run after clean. Then we can say restore. Uh, we can say clean should be should come before restore, or we could say restore should be after clean. Publish triggers announce. We can say publish triggers announce uh, as a method call. Or we say uh, announce triggered by publish. There are a couple more um, methods you can call on those flu uh, on this fluent interface, which is first um, cleanup must always run. Uh, and and by this, but cleanup is not the same as clean like here, but cleanup is more like something after the build happened. So more like in terms of an i disposable for instance something that is guaranteed to be uh, to be called so in this case we could say cleanup is assured after failure or we have another thing which is announced must, must not stop execution because it is yeah if it's uh, if it succeeded or not it's not really important everything else should still uh, um, continue as usual then we can say announce uh, should proceed after failure just to swallow those but still show them we can express uh, express conditions for our targets and there's a nice catch we can because we can uh, evaluate them statically 
which means that they will be checked at the uh, before or at the start of our build, um, which makes it easier to um, to skip certain targets. Um, or we can use uh, only when dynamic. In that case, the condition will be checked immediately before execution. But the interesting thing here, if a target has dependencies and and we check it dynamically, then those de de dependencies might have already been executed. So that is when only when static comes into play. And for this only when static, we can also define the skip behavior for the um, for the dependencies, which is when skip, we can say uh, dependency, dependencies should also be skipped, or when skipped, uh, they should still execute for whatever reason. <clears throat> the next ingredient is CLI to support. And for that, uh, <laughs> the slide comes rather surprising and I didn't have time to, to review them again. Um, but the idea here is, and just by the way, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to endorse building nukes or anything. Uh, it just happened to be the name. <laughs> Um, but the idea with CLI tool support is many of the build systems out there, uh, like Cake or, or Fake, for instance, they come with support for CLI tools like the .NET CLI, Docker, like Git, Git version, the unit testing frameworks, XUnit, NUnit, and many, many more, actually. So there are so many tools that you, that you would like to use inside your build. And... And this always bothered me a little because those support APIs um, were usually written manually. And with Nuke, I followed a different approach where those APIs are generated. And from the next slide, I will look at you how to use one of those APIs for the .NET CLI. So here, um, this is what you see here is just Rider inside one of those targets. And we can uh, call .NET build. And we can do this just by typing DNB, which is the uh, initial letter search, and then complete. <clears throat> and the idea here is that for this uh, call, what we already get is a simple call like .NET space build, OK? And afterwards, what we do is to, to manipulate the arguments that we pass in addition. And the first one, if we just go further, uh, we can type dot project and we can see we can manipulate the, the project file. We can set it, we can reset it. Then there's also another property uh, or argument which we can set, which is uh, the project URL. And for this, we can also reset or set it. And then we can continue. We set the project file to the solution. And let's say we also want to en uh, enable the no restore flag, then we can do it like this. Um, let's go back from for a moment, because for Boolean values, I mean, the, the no restore flag is just a switch, right? So for switches, we not only have uh, set and reset, but we also have enable, disable, and toggle. If you if we like um, those, um, let's go back for a second. Those builder APIs here. The great benefit for them is that they make it very easy to construct different invocations. And uh, I will I will show you, uh, or just an explanation. Yeah, uh, maybe in uh, vo vocally is enough. But just assume. Oh, no, I, I will do it in the next slide, actually. Let's follow. <laughs> Sorry. Um, another thing we might want to set is the verbosity. For those, we also have set and reset. And the interesting thing here is that verbosity has a defined set of values that we can pass. And now this API provides us all the values that are possible here. We can use an enumeration. Actually, it's not an enumeration. It's a class, but it looks like an enum enumeration. Um, one more cool thing, I think, 
if you navigate with your cursor to the set project file, for instance, and you call for the help, then what you see here is the very same help uh, help text that you would see on the official Microsoft uh, documentation. The same was the case, by the way, here. So here, .NET build, we can see the full uh, docu documentation for the .NET build command. So let's go further. And this is an example of the uh, metadata that I extracted for the .NET uh, um, CLI. So like I said before, um, I didn't want to write these APIs manually. Um, I rather generate them from metadata. And in some, in, for some tools, those uh, metadata um, are written manually. Like for the .NET CLI, I did it manually. For, um, let's say, Docker or Helm or Kubernetes, um, those are generated from the actual sources of, of those tools because they have uh, such a lot of, para uh, of, of arguments that you can pass um, that it's really useful to use a second source or the official source for generating uh, these metadata. Actually, I like to call them specification files, um, but let's look at one of those. So, for instance, for the .NET build uh, command, and this is just this is just a tiny bit of the specification file. But at some point, we can define that this has a, a project file that we can pass, and it's of type string. And sin since it's the first property, it will just pass the value. So we have format just the value. Um, this thing, let's skip it because it actually doesn't exist anymore. Then we have the help text, which is actually HTML rendered. We have another property, which is called configuration. Again, in C Sharp, it's represented as a string. And now we have the format uh, which tells or which, which expresses that this is passed by, by um, appending dash dash configuration and then the value. Another thing for, for no restore, we've also just looked at that. Uh, in that case, we would define the type as being a bool. And for the format, we just have dash dash no restore. Now we have uh, something more advanced for, for this Fluent API. And that is, um, that is the when call. So these first two should be clear by now. And this one is a fluent way to express an if statement. And what we say here is that only if published test results, which is a Boolean, then these additional modifications should be done. And I kind of missed to do that here, but just imagine how you would write that if there was no way, uh, if there was no fluent API like here. Because what, what you would do is to have a couple of if statements which append to a pre-existing string and just depending at the very end, at the very end. And then maybe at some point you want to override some other argument and you're a bit lost and things get really messy. So this is a, this is a way to uh, fluently have conditions for certain argument modifications. And this is the first part for composition. A uh, second way to compose invocations is, is that, uh, with the combine with. And just to, to explain the use case here a little, we're using the .NET NuGet push command to push several packages. Let's say we have 10 packages. Then what we want to do is to first set the source, the symbol source, the API key. Those are common uh, values that we pass. But then we also want to pass our 10 packages, right? And for that, what we can do is to use the combine with call, which in the first part, so here's the first argument, receives an iron numerable, which in that case yields all the packages. And we also here just define that it shouldn't be empty. And the part afterwards um, then only modifies that object again. And actually, what happens is from that call, what we get is 10 different invocations because we have 10 uh, NuGet packages. The very end here looks a bit 
Um, well, not so great, I admit. Um, the first parameter is the usual settings object, so the same as here. It's, it's called combined settings, uh, if you like to. And V is just the value. So we set the value, uh, which is one of the package files, to the target path. And another thing what we can do is to define the degree of parallelism and choose whether it should complete on failure or not. So if the first package fails to execute, do you want to push the other packages still or do you want to abort? You can choose uh, with that flag. And exactly this composition call here, we can see in action right here. This is one of the... One second. This is one of the built uh, servers that I'm using. It's uh, Bitrise, actually. And here we can see it's uh, .NET uh, NuGet push is called for four packages. I only have four. And afterwards, we can see the output from those invocations. Um, the invocations, the output for invocations is, is uh, hold back until the invocation finishes. So you won't have scattered scattered output or something. You will see uh, one invocation after after another to make make it easier to to debug. Um, now, some people may say, okay, this fluent API like here, if you want to use that with, with Git, for instance, nobody would do that. I mean, I like the Fluent interface, but I, I, I'm, I would never use it for, for uh, Git or anything. So that's the reason why I came up with this lightweight resolution of calling tools. And the in the first part, um, I would just explain under what circumstances you can uh, resolve or, or use lightweight resolution. We can, for instance, grab a tool which is accessible from the path environment variable. Like Git is, is available through the path uh, on Unix and Windows systems. So this will, will be resolved from, from the path var variable. Local executables are tools that you have in your repository. And usually this is uh, not a great thing to have. But you can still use it. I mean, if you have coreflex.exe, for instance, um, in your repository, then you can still use that. I actually use it for uh, wrapping a, a Gradle build. So Gradle has those um, has those script files, also bootstrapping scripts called Gradle W, uh, either just Gradle W or Gradle W dot bat for batch file. Um, I actually use that for, for those files. And the third one is package uh, to resolve package executables. So for, for that, all we have to do is define the package ID, where the executable is located, and then the name of the executable. Just the name. It doesn't need to provide the, um, the, the directory structure or something where it is located. And now those... Those tools here, Git, Coreflex, XUnit, those are injected. I mean, you can see it's a field. Those are injected uh, by Nuke uh, to have an instance of tool. And tool is actually a delegate and can be used like that. So for instance, Git, um, if we had one of those fields, then we can call Git just like that, just if it was a method. And the first part is the arguments. And you can see um, it's pretty cool because I can also use string interpolation. So just imagine how you would do that with um, with MS Bill, for instance. Uh, that would be a pain to construct uh, arguments like that. And something something that we don't see here. I mean, this is just a this is the proper example that I'm actually using. Um, but what we can't see here is that we can also pass the working directory as an optional argument. We can pass environment variables. We can say if it should have a log file. Um, we can define a timeout, all, all those things. It's basically um, a nice way to use process.start, um, but in a method way, in a more elegant way. 
one thing though that um, we have to do to use those tools. So let's let's speak for for instance about X unit. Uh, this definition on its own won't work in your build because you're depending on the X unit runner console package. So because you're depending on that package, you also need to define the uh, the package reference or the the tool dependency. So this is part of the normal CS project file. And package download is an addition to .NET Core, I think it was in, in the .NET Core 3 release. It's similar to package reference with the only difference that this won't give uh, references to our project. So it's only, the, the only thing it expresses is that this tool should be downloaded. So we define our tool dependencies. We can uh, depend on Git version, open cover. Those are some that I actually use in my uh, in one of my projects, along with the version, of course. And other um, other systems like like Cake, for instance, um, I think Fake too. They have a very different way to define um, tool dependencies. They have pre preprocessor directives. Um, which you which you don't get much tooling for, um, but for those, actually, you can see them in the NuGet um, in the NuGet tool window in Visual Studio Writer. You can update them from there, and it also yeah it uses the existing uh, infrastructure basically the existing uh, tools IDEs etc. The next thing is path handling. That was a, cr a crazy idea, I think, at that time. Um, I, at some point, I mean, it, it wasn't often actually, um, but sometimes I ran into issues with paths being off in terms of, um, I mean, paths being 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 wrong due to the fact that I was in the wrong working directory or that the tool didn't understand uh, if I use the wrong slashes, for instance, um, because we have to choose backslash or slash based on our operating system. Um, so I thought, um, how can how can this issue be solved? And that resulted in the path handling idea. And what we do is to use the division operator to kind of mimic the path separator. So in this case, like if I want to uh, dive into the source directory, then we have this existing root directory. This is provided from the base class, from the nuke build base class. And it's the directory what I've been talking about earlier with the .nuke file. This is the root directory. And then we can say slash or divided by source actually. And the great benefit of that is that Absolute, it's an instance of absolute path, but it will be converted to string automatically. It has an implicit conversion defined. And depending on your current operating system, it will either yield a backslash or a slash, just to make it correct for your uh, platform. Okay, we have two properties, uh, source directory and output directory. Now, again, the great thing is we can use actual uh, software engineering uh, to have uh, have a good abstraction of all these. So we can use output directory to dive further into the report directory. So due to that fact, also um, refactorings like extract variable work very well because extract variable, at least in, in Rider and ReSharper, uh, we'll see if you have multiple uses of the same expression, it will offer you to properly clean up your code and extract the variable from all its usages. Still, if you need a Unix relative path, for instance, you can do so by calling get Unix relative path 2. Uh, same for um, win Windows relative paths. And here at the very bottom, uh, we can also see we can use a globbing mechanism to to get all the markdown files which lie beyond below the root directory. So this double asterisk um, will tell us to dive in, in all the subdirectories 
and then all the files which have uh, which are called .md or have md as the extension. And then we have an iron removal based on that. Next thing, next ingredient, uh, the sixth is value auto injection. And a common issue for for build scripts, what I've seen is getting values into your build. Like for instance, passing a configuration that you want to compile your project with, release or debug for instance, or to um, calculate values, like for instance, um, semantic version numbers. Some people use Git version um, to generate them based on their Git history, which is actually a re really great way. So I can really, really uh, recommend that. There exist different approaches. There's uh, Git version. There's also a nerd bank Git version. I don't really know the difference, to be honest. Um, but there's also Minver. Uh, which um, which got a little more popular recently. Um, so yeah, these two things, getting input values in and calculating values up front. Uh, some people use a setup target for that. And those are things that I wanted to solve with the value auto injection. And how this works, we can see here. So for input parameters, what I came up with is the parameter attribute, which you can put onto uh, fields and properties. And for their type, we can use normal strings. We can have arrays. We can have uh, booleans. This boolean could also be uh, not nullable, but in that case, it would be false by default, whereas uh, with the nullable here, it's null if we don't pass anything. It can be the configuration. Configuration here is a set of release or debug, and it can be an absolute path. And on the left side here, what we can see is how we called our build. So the same as, I, uh, as I've shown before, where you type nuke in the command line. And if we then pass dash dash value hello, then this will be resolved to hello. We pass array ABC. We can see uh, it got, I mean, in the implementation, it got actually uh, concatenated with, an, with a comma. And just to mention, this output here is actually just a target, which comes right after the definition right here. But it's for, for presenting, this is a bit easier. Uh, for the switch, it's enough to type dash dash switch, and we can see it's becoming true. Uh, I, I could also pass a uh, space false, for instance. In that case, it would be false, really. Configuration, we pass release. Yeah, it's not much magic. I think um, absolute path will get uh, expanded to the actual absolute path because we want to. We want an absolute path and not a relative one um, to avoid this working directory issue. And we can also see, um, we can grab some information from the Git repository. So here the attribute will inject some information about the Git repository that we are using, which includes the branch, the commit hash, the current one, um, and all that stuff. And we can also see we have, well, if the thing is not in the way, I'm sorry, I can't use the pointer, but we can also see the Git version number, which has been generated. One great thing about um, those parameters that we can pass, and just imagine we have a parameter like API key, which we would, which we need to pass to our build to successfully publish packages to nuget.org. Um, we can use them in in something called requirements calls. So here we have a publish target, which depends on clean test pack. Uh, similar to what I've shown you before. But as we've seen before, this pipeline is pretty long. So if we first need to compile, we have to test, we have to pack. And now it would be very dull if we execute our build and only when we when we get to the point where we can execute publish, uh, we see that the API key was not uh, was not supplied. Would be very, very annoying. 
But instead, with Nuke, what we can do is to express this requirement, and we uh, can say API key should be uh, is required, just like webhook, get the auth token, and it's also required that the configuration uh, equals release. And if one of those requirements isn't met, then the build will fail immediately upon start. That's the great thing, to have a fast fail behavior. And those parameters are also automatically added to the help text. Uh, so here, uh, the, the last parameters, those are the default parameters, which every build has. And the first part of, of the parameters is uh, the user defined or custom parameters. And you can see, you can also define a description. The description would actually be put here in the constructor of the attribute. So you can pass another constructor um, string argument if you like, but uh, there's also the way to just have uh, no description. Uh, next ingredient is solution model. And this is something that I don't use very often, but it's really helpful to actually have in some certain uh, situations. For instance, to publish only a couple of projects. So here, let's, let's start at the very first. Uh, we have a solution property which already exists, but is not uh, noted here in the slide. But from that solution, we can get a project um, which is called nuke.globaltool. This belongs to my to my solution. And it's not just a string or a path or something. It's an actual project um, instance. Now I have two of those also for the new MS build task uh, project. And now we want, let, let's skip this part from a, from a moment, moment and concentrate on the latter part. What we want to do is to call .NET publish for those two projects and um, call it with the respective project and framework. We can see here uh, it might have different frameworks because Global Tool uh, is, com is uh, published for only for, the dot, uh, for .NET Core, but MS Build Task must be published for .NET Framework and .NET Core. So we use this combined uh, thing, which I already explained before, so, but now what, what's missing is the published configurations. And this is now very interesting because uh, we can construct this link query here to first iterate over all our projects that we want to have published configurations for. And then for those published configurations, we get the, the respective target frameworks which exists. And then we create an, an anonymous type to actually use that here to pass the project and the framework. And what happens is that for new global tool, we get a pair with just the one framework. And for MS build task, we get two pairs with the one project, but the two other frameworks. And one more interesting thing here is that behind this call, get target frameworks, Actually, what happens is that MS build is getting queried. So we don't parse, <clears throat> we, we don't just parse the, the CS project file or anything, but we actually use the MS build infrastructure and the packages to uh, find values. So you can, you can also retrieve other properties or you can get all the items that are going to be compiled. You can do, uh, quite a lot um, with those project instances. Another thing what we can do, and I like this approach, this is, this is uh, very cool uh, for, the, for the case. Just imagine you are, maybe you actually do. Uh, in, in your company, you might have uh, some projects which depend on a core framework which is uh, maintained in-house at your company. Okay, so you have, uh, I, I like to call them core, a core project and leaf projects. And those leaf projects use the core project, of course. And, but you would like to have one 
global solution. So usually you go with uh, single solutions where only the leaf projects are in and the core project, etc. But for major refactorings, it would be really great to have a global solution where all the projects are contained. And this is how you can do it. So um, first here we can see we are checking out some external repositories, which are the leaf projects, let's say. And then we uh, we are creating a, a new solution, um, which we can give the file name. And then we can pass a couple of other solution objects. And this folder name provider is for the um, solution, fo solution folder name. And just we're, just with a couple of lines, I mean, this is, this is of course a helper method, but just with a couple of lines, um, we can generate one, uh, this global solution and it's really great. I use that for, for Nuke as well. It's really great to have that. By the way, one thing I, I missed before to, to explain. So here you can see create solution and this is invoked just like a method. This method is not defined in, in the build or in the, in the base class or anything. This belongs to an actual uh, project model task class. But what I tend to do is to use import static quite a lot to make the build uh, feel more natural uh, in terms of language. So you see that a lot. Also, the, the previous thing that I've shown you with the .NET build uh, task that also um, belongs to a common uh, class and it's not in, in the same base implementation or something. Those, those classes are all very well separated, um, but I use this import static quite a lot. Okay, <clears throat> next thing. I hope I said I have 10, so two more left after that one, uh, is CI support. And for CI support, um, there are two things. The first thing in terms of support is most of the CI systems like Jenkins, uh, TeamCity, GitHub Actions, um, Travis CI, most of them provide certain environment variables and Nuke gives you typed access to them. Let's see if very quickly. No, let's not go further yet. Um, so we have typed access to environment variables. <clears throat> Another thing um, Nuke brings is proper output for those systems. So, so console output, I mean. And the first example we can see here with uh, GitHub Actions, we can see, well, first the big ass uh, uh, logo for Nuke and some version information, but we can also see that targets are actually collapsed into expandable uh, ex expandable regions just to have a better overview how how our build was executed we also see the summary for the first time probably something i should include at the uh, at the first uh, slides uh, a bit earlier but yeah this is the summary to see uh, which targets have have succeeded and which have failed and how long they took. Okay, um, so that for output, but there's not only the output that Nuke um, serves you in a good way, but another thing is to actually invoke our build, uh, our, our build project. And like I've shown before, we have those build PowerShell and shell scripts and Many of the other projects, what they usually tell you is that, okay, you can pretty easily uh, switch your, your build from TeamCity to GitHub Actions, for instance, uh, because it's just the invocation of the, of the bootstrapping script. Now, Nuke takes that a step further, and you don't even need to write those configurations. Like for, for AppVayer, you have the appveyor.yaml file, um, for GitHub Actions, you also have YAML files uh, in, a, in, a, in the .github folder. And for AppVayor, it's similar, also a YAML file. Um, I don't like YAML so much, so that's one of the reasons why I came up with the idea to generate them. And let's look at an example. For AppVayor, we can define that 
uh, we just put an attribute onto our build class. We can define which images it should be executed on. And we can, we can define the invoke targets. So in this case, we want to invoke test and pack as part of our CI build. One very cool thing here, uh, due to the fact that we have properties, we can make use of the name of operator here. So if we change the name of the test property, then everything will still work. Now with that, with that attribute on our build class, one thing that we have to do is to execute one time. Uh, preferably, what I always do is to call it with dash dash help, just to regenerate the, um, the, the configuration files. And if we do that, then what we see as a warning is that configurations file, uh, that configuration files for Team City, for instance, have changed or GitHub Actions. Uh, those warnings will only be, be shown when something has changed with your build. Um, to make you aware and uh, so that you know that you have to uh, commit those files again. But how does one of those con um, files actually look? So this is the AppVayer YAML file again. And we can see it's auto-generated. It has the image, just like, I, like I've shown before, the two images. And it evokes the build script with PowerShell and then this stuff. So this is pretty f uh, straightforward, I guess. Now, one thing that hooks into that is that for targets, we can also define that they produce something, namely artifacts. So the pack target produces a couple of NuGet packages. If we define it like that on our target and regenerate the configuration, then what we see in AppVare is actually that those artifacts have been published without any additional effort where we don't need to change the YAML for that. We also see that the TRX files are here. So those are uh, have been uh, created from during the testing part, uh, but we can see our NuGet packages as well. Um, Let's stay here, and usually I would like to blank out for a moment, but I want to motivate another use case, and that is if you have a large project with lots of tests, and let's say you have you have ten test projects, and <clears throat> in in some in in some those test projects take an hour to execute. Or for the for the matter of easier math, let's say they take uh, 100 minutes to execute. 10 projects, 100 minutes to execute. Um, now, it would be great to parallelize the execution of those test, uh, tests. So then, if we execute each of them in parallel, then it would be only 10 minutes instead of 100 minutes, right? And in Nuke, this is pretty easy. It's done with three lines of code, actually. Um, so let's look at that. First, we have the test target again. And if we skip that for a moment, that other part, uh, this last call here is, is again very, very much the same as, I, as I've shown you already to publish packages. It's, it's uh, calling .NET test. We set the configuration. Uh, we can say set no builds, pretty much irrelevant here. And then we combine the invocation with different test projects. We also define the TRX file here uh, to have an, a proper name because usually uh, TRX files have more like a cryptic name, at least last time I've checked. But now let's get, get back to the parallelization. And for the parallelization to happen, the first thing we have to do is to define a test partition. Uh, so the the idea here is to have a field, and I name it the same way as the target is named. So it's test partition. If this was called publish partition, uh, published, then you would call it publish partition. Um, it's of type partition, and also attributed, and it has uh, two as passed as the size. 
And in our case, it should be 10 actually, because like I said, we have 10 uh, test projects. Then with that partition, we assign it to the test target because of that Nuke knows that the partition should be different for different test invocations. And then we get all the test projects from our solution like that. And then we get only the relevant projects for our current execution. So usually uh, with big enterprise systems, what you have is a couple of agents that can happily execute something. And this partition would be injected on each of those uh, agents with a different value. So it's one of 10, two of 10, three, uh, three of 10, or actually first of 10, second of 10, et cetera, you know. And um, from all the test projects, then what we do is just getting the current for the current agent. And then we can use relevant projects instead of all projects here in this combined with call. And in practice, it looks like that. So this is um, this is Azure Pipelines. And you can see without any additional effort, uh, we have two configurations, test one and two. Uh, so in my case, I only have two um, uh, because I have defined two here as the size. I only have two, but I um, reduce the execution time in favor of using multiple agents. All right. Also, what we can see here on Azure Pipelines, uh, it's executing on different um, on different images as well. On Team City, it looks like that. Uh, so we have a common build configuration with which accumulates all of those. So we can see tests past two hundred. 40 and this is a bit sad because uh for nuke i actually only have two test projects and the one contains 239 and the other one contains only one test um but i still think you kind of get the idea uh what happens here another cool thing in team city uh, we've already looked at the parameters which you can inject uh, the fields that are attributed with the parameter attribute. And for the Team City API, we can even generate, um, we, we can even use that knowledge like requires, for instance. We can see due to the requires API key, we have the uh, little red indicator here to show us that this value must be provided. For configuration, we have seen that only debug and release are possible values. Source has a default value assigned. So like, with the field initializer, the Bosity also has a defined set of possible values. So this is very um, comfortable to, to invoke um, also. Now, next ingredient, and I think this is very, this is a, a very important thing for, for any tool that you want to use. You want to, make it uh, as highly integrated with existing tooling as possible. And one of that is IDE extensions. So Cake, for instance, also comes with IDE extensions. But if you don't have those extensions, it's pretty much, in most cases, just a text file. And you can't really work with that. You can't, you can't rename variable, variables, for instance, or, or fields. Uh, you can't refactor your code very well. Um, in Nuke, this is already much different because, because it's just a console application. Uh, but in addition, we have other extensions. Uh, we still have extensions to make life even more easy. The first thing for that is that those extensions, and they exist for Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and Rider, and Resharper also. They allow you to have this end target snippet, and that end target snippet will generate uh, a target um, stub for you. So you can name it, and then you tap, and you're inside this execute method. Another thing for, for VS Code is uh, it has this command palette integration. So we can call Nuke and then run a target in, in the next 
place you would be asked for the target name and it's also provided so it has the same completion and we can also see for individual tar individual targets we we have this little code lens items here to run the target or to debug it also we can choose to debug a target or run it with dependency skipped in visual studio it looks like that um, the way is not really great, and I'm honest, I, I mostly copied the idea. I think it's the best you can get, um, but I copied the idea which the cake, cake team had to integrate in the task runner explorer. <clears throat> and what we see here is just to have uh, the targets listed. You select one of them uh, or double-click it, and then you get a console uh, to follow the build. On the left, you can decide to attach to the build process. So also debugging works works very well. And the second one is to, the second button, which is a bit hidden, is to uh, skip dependencies. Now my favorite way inside Rider, um, it's integrated like that. So you see here in the gutter mark, you have this little icon, this little nuke icon for a target uh, definition. And you can either click that, or if you have your cursor somewhere here in the in in the in the in the declaration of clean, so it can be here, here, or somewhere here, then you can hit Alt Enter. And if you press Enter again, and clean is selected, then it would just execute clean. If you uh, move to the right with the arrow keys, then you can decide to uh, debug that and the debugger will be attached or to run debug without dependencies. And the very cool thing uh, when, when I was porting that to Rider, so first we had that for Resharper and afterwards for Rider, um, is that I, I automatically got it on my MacBook Touch uh, bar. So that was very little... Uh, work to do to actually uh, achieve that. But it was just so nice to uh, see that little icon on the touch bar. One thing that is mostly work in progress is a live dependency diagram. So here you see on the left, uh, we have the clean target, which has a definition before publish. Uh, well, let's see this again before restore sorry and we are adding or removing that and inside this live diagram we can see uh in this case it's uh it's in a proper way no in this case it's it's the proper way to have it before restore and if we remove it then clean is somewhere here in the middle and we don't want it there actually you can also double click here to jump to the targets um um, and have an easier navigation, basically. I think that's the last part, uh, build sharing. So mm, much of the, mm, how to say, very often with builds, we have them similar and different uh, for different projects. And Nuke comes with a couple more build sharing alternatives that you can use to write your code only once, but use it in different repositories. Um, so there are a couple. Uh, Git modules is one of them. This is not really something that is specific to Nuke, um, but you can use that. Another thing is Nougat packages. So since this is just a C-sharp project, um, you can provide your own base type, for instance. Also very straightforward in, in, in the usual way uh, for .NET. Another thing is called external files. And external files work in the way that you define a, a URL somewhere. And as part of, of your build boot, bootstrapping, uh, this file will get downloaded. Um, the fourth idea is to have .NET global tools. To, so if you have a build <clears throat> and you want to distribute that in your, in your company and users of this build uh, should not be able to, to change it or anything, then what you can do is to uh, publish your build implementation as a .NET global tool and people can use it from anywhere on the command line. 
And the fifth is default interface imp uh, uh, members, interface default members. Um, with those, the idea is to have implementation implementations to reside in interfaces. So this is, is a feature of C Sharp um, 8. And it solves the, the, the diamond problem, basically. So the problem of multiple inheritance. And we will look at the last three uh, very briefly. The first, or actually, yeah, actually we start with default uh, interface default members. So just suppose, uh, I, want, I want to make this very briefly and instead have a couple more questions maybe. Suppose you can implement the I publish NuGet here, and this is basically just a just a hierarchy of ideas which you can use. So uh, it doesn't need to look like that. What I want to concentrate more on is this I announce interface, and you see it's an interface, but still we can actually uh, implement the announce. Uh, isn't it written with only a single letter N? Uh, anyway. Um, we can actually implement that announce uh, target and have just the logger to print uh, the message. And uh, what we also see here is this try triggered by I publish NuGet and then the publish target. This is because this interface doesn't directly inherit from I publish NuGet. We could, if we want, if we have, if we want to have a direct dependency. But this try, what this try does here is to check if the current build uh, implements this I publish NuGet interface, and only then it will be triggered by the publish target. So this is just to have a little more freedom uh, with how your builds are structured. But otherwise, so for instance here, you can derive from the I build uh, interface, for instance, which would define uh, the, the compile target, for instance, and you can you, uh, you you can you can really compose your build in that way. And just to also show the magic, uh, what we do is to inherit from from those two things, and we can see build inherits from them, and it has to provide the output directory, which is uh, part of the um, let's see, it should be part of the I has package output interface message is defined in this interface so it doesn't have a default implementation so we need to provide it and also we have a new target which is added so a target that is specific to our build which is called clean and it should happen before i build restore it is a dependency for the published target and we have yeah just some implementation so that's for that's it for interface default members a second thing is global tools which i briefly mentioned and for that everything you have to do is most of this is your usual build cs project file what's interesting is this pack as tool true and this tool command name which is uh, set to build in this case and if i call dotnet pack on this project then what happens is that it creates a NuGet package which, which has this uh, structure. So it's co uh, actually compiled for .NET Core and this package, so this is just the output from, from the NuGet package manager uh, or NuGet package explorer. Um, this can be installed in the same way as the nu Nuke uh, global tool and then be used across your um, projects. The third one is external files. And for that, like I said before, somewhere in your CS project file, we define a, a URL to, it, it can also be a local path if you like to. Um, but before the build is executed, it will make sure that this file exists in, and we can also define the base path inside our build directory. And this is very interesting because I'm even uh, downloading a default build implementation here. So I don't even have a C-sharp file. Um, and I can also, if you have, if you have certain values which uh, should be different, uh, this also uses a templating approach. So we can uh, define, for instance, that .NET should be used or we can uh, 
define a source URL. I think we should see that here. So this build uh, C-sharp file is actually here. And we can see um, for those lines, I mean, this is, this is a very rudimentary idea. Um, for those lines, they should only be compiled or only be used when we define MS build, whereas if we define .NET, it should use this part, right? And also at the very end, and I need to stop moving my cursor again, we have this uh, source URL placeholder, which gets replaced. And when the build is executed, what actually happens is the resulting build C sharp file is actually this one, because we've provided the, the source URL here, We've defined that uh, we should we want to use .NET, so it only only will use the second part. Um, it's not a, an approach that I use often, but it was actually the first one uh, which was meant to help with build sharing. And that said, that's all I have for you. Uh, you can ask questions. Uh, for most part, uh, that's just a. Or uh, let's go back for a moment. First things first. I would really appreciate if you give it a star uh, on on the GitHub project or follow the the Twitter handle. And um, if you have any questions now, I also have this playground repository, which is also available in the GitHub organization. And you can play with a couple of things there. For instance, uh, we had um, we had the path construction, for instance, uh, with the <clears throat> division operator or if you want to see how CI configuration works for different uh, CIs then you can see here for GitHub Actions it looks like that uh, you just, just can play with it a little so GitHub Actions for instance you can then also see how the resulting workflow uh, looks like or for Team City um, uh, Kotlin script is generated so this is again auto generated for the uh, for Team City as the CI system, quite huge. Um, but yeah, with that said, thanks for for watching, and now I'm open for for questions. Thank you. Um, I think people are stunned <laughs> of your presentations. There are not so many questions. Uh, there's one comment, and I see two questions. One comment was right just uh, when you started talking that there is that there is a pet project I think you say and there was such comments that I hope it's yeah. a project <laughs> okay and about the questions okay there is a first one from Lech other operations than division no <laughs> this is the only thing uh, let me think I think that's the only one. I know it. <clears throat> uh, hardcore uh, C sharp developers uh, probably want to kill me for that, but I think it's it's uh, the really perfect use case for that. I mean, plus would would look very suspicious, um, and yeah. Okay, thank you. I see another one from Daniel. <clears throat> Partitioning. Um, partitioning work doesn't work with GitHub Actions because GitHub Actions, um, at least as far as I know, doesn't uh, implement the idea of running multiple agents. So we can have different uh, stages, etc. But there is nothing that uh, can run different stages in parallel. So uh, no, unfortunately, no. Um, when I, <clears throat> I can okay, also just yes. Yeah. Uh, that's no problem. I think this is the last one from Black again. Um, uh, can be used with Azure DevOps to manually set up my builds instead of creating them in pipeline and web UI. Yes. Um, the only thing you have to do is um, to go to the Azure Pipelines interface and point it to the repository, and then it's done. Then it would be the same. And let me share my screen again, uh, like that. OK. 
Okay, we can, for instance, I have an open already. Um, I have my pipelines here. And the only thing is I pointed it to the new repository. And this is what I see. So for instance, here with the last commit, uh, I see three different stages, uh, which are used to execute on different environments, Windows, uh, Mac, and Ubuntu. And if I dive into that, um, I can see all the errors. I can see uh, te test results and how, uh, how much uh, percentage has succeeded. Uh, it's not 100% because some were skipped. Um, code coverage, well, some things you still have to do manually, like providing code coverage. Uh, the the uh, reports to Azure. Um, but other than that, you can browse into that. You can see the compile step here. Uh, then see how it was invoked. Um, then scroll down a little. We can see here the restore and compile was executed and so on. Yeah. Okay, I think that was the last one. There are some comments from Daniel that that ask everyone to sponsor. Nuke is a great tool. Personally, I never use I I never used Nuke, but after this presentation, I'll definitely give a try. So that's from yeah, my yeah. Side. please. We also we also have a uh, we have a <laughs> yeah. I just read about the the joke. Yeah, not going to run it as a, it's a picture. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I I was I was a bit uh, nervous today, mostly for the fact that it was so quickly. I expected the presentation to be at ten. I'm not sure if uh, uh, everyone noticed that, but yeah. Uh, um, what I wanted to say is we also have a Slack channel. Uh, and the great thing is there are very nice people over there, so including Rodney and Daniel, um, who are using it. And it's just a great place also to chat about issues. So it doesn't always need to be related to Nuke. If any one of you has uh, issues with certain build-related tasks, and that could be related to Jenkins, it could be why is .NET CLI doing this and that? And what MS build uh, properties need, do I need to set to do this and that? This is the place uh, to ask your questions. And uh, another There's question. There's one question, yes, the last one. Are there any limitations that you are aware of? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th I think there, there have been limitations. Um, but most of them have been, I mean, every time that I stumble across a limitation, I you can be sure I try to solve it in some way. And so far, I don't see anything that prevents you from doing something additionally. Instead, Nuke makes it quite easy to integrate more ideas. So I want to show something really quick, if, if, if I may. Um, sure. Let's see. Uh, I should open. Where is it? I think it should be here. And what I've shown you is the value auto injection. And just the other day, I would, uh, do you sure anything? Because uh, I cannot see the screen to add to the stream. Ah, sorry. I need to share. Yeah. Yep. My my bad. So okay. it's fine now. Um, just something that I came up with recently uh, during my work at JetBrains. Uh, what I needed was was three different uh, properties, and that is. Let me see with which I start. Uh, latest NuGet burn, for instance. So this attribute also uses the infrastructure provided by Nuke uh, for value auto injection, and. Yeah, it takes a moment to make it co colorized, which would look a, a bit better. Um, but the idea is that this property, uh, this field is also automatically injected upon start of the build, and it inserts the latest version of the JetBrains ReSharper SDK package, NuGet package, which is available on NuGet.org. We can also define to include pre-releases or not, to include unlisted packages or not. In this case, I need to include unlisted packages. 
Another another thing is latest MyGet version. Actually, I already removed that. So in the final version, it will be just latest MyGet version. And there is a feed which is called RD snapshots and a package with, which is called RD gen. And actually, this is a Maven uh, package, but I still I, I'm still able to hide that yeah rather tedious code behind that attribute. Latest GitHub release version. It's the very same. You pass a repository and the, the owner and the name. And uh, we can actually go there. Let me see. Uh, so github.com, Brains created IntelliJ plugin. And we can see releases version 0 0.50. And this is actually what will get injected right here. And then I use those values uh, in my targets to update certain places. And this was done, yeah, th this was just one of the ideas very recently. So it's quite extensible. Um, it shouldn't prevent you from doing anything what you're used to, like the way how you manage NuGet packages. It's, it's the very same. Uh, the way how you structure your code, it's, it's the very same. Uh, you can use partial classes. You can extract into other methods. You, you even can unit test your... Uh, your build, uh, if you like to. I mean, the the uh, what you write in your targets, you you could in some way uh, write tests for that. So no limitations, as far as I'm concerned. Great. Okay, I think we finished with the questions. Mm -hmm. So Matthias, thank you very much. That sure. that um, shows the the, the um, possibility of the nuke and generally for the presentation. And for everyone, thank you for watching us uh, right now, live streaming or later uh, on on YouTube. Thank you very much, and see you guys. See you. Bye bye. Bye.